It is the Anfield Wrap, Neil Atkinson with Beth Lindup, with Dan Austin and with John Gibbons to talk about predominantly Liverpool 4, Tottenham Hotspur 2, any other matters arising, uh, but we are, like every single podcast this year, uh, we are brought to you in association with Green King, where football is more than a game. So if you want to make Green King your go-to destination for the, the running, the kick out, kick on of the season, uh, you can do that. Watch every Liverpool televised game down there, refreshing food and delicious beverages, uh, 900 sports clubs dotted across the UK, and you're always the walking distance of your local Green King uh, as we always say at the Anfield Rap football's much more fun with people so you can do that get on the WhatsApp groups get people down uh, whether it's European last four whether it's n- n- nail biting relegation six pointers not that many more of them after, to- after Nottingham Forest won uh, you can do all of that download the app uh, and enjoy the discounts and the competitions that are on there whenever there's a game on I said it before it's Dan John and Beth here couldn't ask for any more um one of your favourite ever games supporting Liverpool was Liverpool 5, Roma 2. And in quite a low-key way, this game sort of reminded me of that, Dan. Yeah, I suppose it was, actually. Um, I really liked the approach from the beginning. It felt like the whole ground, the people on the pitch and everyone in the crowd had just decided that they've had enough of things being shit and miserable and irritating and everyone was just going to have a good time. Uh, the sun was shining, the weather had been good for a few days in the build-up, it was bank holiday, it just felt like everything was was turning towards things being that, that bit better. I, I got up in the morning and felt that the, the XS uh, expected shorts was high uh, yeah. and, and, and everyone produced. Yeah, it, it paid dividends. Um, people really committed, both both on the pitch and in the stands. Um, I, think, I think it did help that, that Tottenham... Them, themselves have been really miserable and in terrible form and play in a way that I think really suits Liverpool. It's not too dissimilar. It means that the game is quite naturally open from the beginning. So there's not really the idea of a team coming and stamping the way that they play on it and stifling Liverpool in some way. It's very much by by default on Liverpool's terms because it's so similar. And I think that meant that everybody was was just really relaxed. All the players that were selected were able to do what they would naturally like to do without having to, to worry about too much else. And also all of the all of the pressure had, had been taken away. They'd obviously had the, the week off, but I think what was more important was the, the idea that your top and two really good teams are hunting you down um, wasn't really there anymore. And obviously we'd have all preferred that that was still there. But I think it, it lent itself to a really quite, quite unleashed Liverpool performance um, where the idea of, you know, it went from we're doing it for the manager and this is this is really positive momentum and that's a good reason to oh my god we're doing it for the manager and that's that's a really big thing to deal with to maybe a bit of a reset and everyone just trying to make sure that he has as nice a time as possible before the end um john uh, Basuma has an attempt from a free kick after three minutes uh, then until the 52nd minute liverpool have 18 shots to tottenham's at zero wow um, that's how long that run goes for, uh, where all the pressure's Liverpool's. All of it is, is is Liverpool bringing it to bear. And, you know, this is a Spurs side whose attack and prowess I'm happy to describe as relatively vaunted. Now, not as vaunted as some, but there is a sense that they're the progressive football team at all times. For Liverpool, I think... I think they just make mincemeat of them for, for 50 minutes and Spurs haven't got... They just do not have a coherent answer. It's The game is Liverpool's. It's absolutely dominant. Yeah, they, they have a bit of a go early Spurs in that... I don't know whether they were thinking, oh, oh we can get at Liverpool early or whether it's just sort of they want they want to play and, and way, the way they would have done anyway. But they have sort of a bit of a go and then there's party going, oh, here we go. Is this going to be one of those where, where they where they score after seven and, and we're having to sort of do that again. And and the players, like you say, just sort of decided they're not having it. And the, the players just go like, oh no, all right, they've, they've, they've had a shot now, now let's just go get control of the game. And, and that's what they did. And and they get control of it through 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 effort as, as much as yep. anything, uh, through through determination, uh, through through making it uncomfortable for the opposition and then, and then attacking well from there. And, you know, Dan's talked a little bit about the the manager and uh, and playing for him and, and and how that can manifest in different ways. I I thought it just looked like a bit of personal pride for me on Sunday. I thought like it just looked to me like that they were going. Do you know what? We've not been good enough, and I can't look in the mirror and say, you know, that that I've been up to the standards that 
is expected of me as a Liverpool player or, or, or I just expected myself. And I thought that's what you saw really, you know, almost kind of like forget about the manager for, for, the, for the minute because I think I think they've probably just had a week where they go like, that. that's that's not what we expect from each other and ourselves. Um, you know, how we've been playing recently, the, the game of Goodison in particular, obviously, but, but, a, but a few others too around it. And I thought the... You know, I thought it was personal pride what you saw and pride in each other and they were a bit more supportive of each other. Uh, there was a lot less, I've just passed it out and I'm going to blame you. Um, there was more backing each other up. There was a couple of times where during that period where I think Spurs could have got a shot away if we hadn't have just had it better. Yeah. Like there was times where, you know, they had a three on three on a break and then suddenly it's a three on six. Because you know what, a few lads have leg back. <laughs> and it's like and it, and it sort of got closed off and, and, and suddenly you know you, you, you're eliminating the shot and, and the best way to, to not concede is, is to eliminate the, the shot happening in the first place and so I really enjoyed it it felt a little bit back to basics but but you know, back to basic sounds like reductive and, it, and it's not because if, you, if your basics are right then you can you can add a flourish on top of that and, and there's Liverpool players capable of doing that and that's what they showed yesterday in the, the idea, back to basics, I think one of the things that happens, whether it's basics or anything else, Beth, is I think Liverpool just get the groove in terms of what they're doing with the ball, what they're doing without the ball. And then there's nothing that this Tottenham side's equipped to do about that. I think you very much see Liverpool in their groove. They can't break that momentum, Tottenham, and Liverpool just stay there. They're just able just to stay there, certainly all the way up until half-time. I'd argue until the hour mark. They're just there, and, and Tottenham are, are, are just a plaything for them at that point. Yeah, and I think under under Jurgen Klopp, Liverpool have probably been one of, if not the best team in in the league. It, it, once they're in the groove, that they're, they're very hard to to stop. And I think, I think what they did yesterday, which was so impressive, and is something that has unfortunately been lacking over the last couple of weeks. And even when Liverpool were, you know, on a fantastic run and and looked like they could go all of the way in the title race, they took it from from one nil to two nil to three nil to four nil with the minimum of fuss, and and that has been. I think that's been the biggest difference over the last few months between Liverpool and Arsenal and Manchester City. You know, Arsenal and City get the first goal in a game and you you think, oh, like, they're going to go on and, and win this 3-4-0. It's going to be a comfortable one. With Liverpool, you've never really felt that this season. There's always been that element of them losing control and them inviting the opposition back into a game. And, you know, you saw in the, in the North London derby last week, obviously Tottenham come back late on but Arsenal have given themselves enough of a cushion that yeah. they're still able to go on and get the win and Liverpool just haven't done that enough over the last few weeks even against you know Sheffield United at home when you know it was a fantastic end to the game the atmosphere was great but in hindsight you look at that and you think it should never have got to that point it should never have got to an Alexis McAllister needing to score an absolute worldie in the 70 something minute um, so I think that was for me the most impressive thing about yesterday is that Liverpool just you know, like you have all said, they, it was almost like they were like, you know what, we've had enough of this now. We've had enough of of giving teams a chance to get back into a game. We're just going to play our game. We're going to get into our groove, and they go on. And you know, even when Tottenham do mount a bit of a comeback, it's it's too little, too late. It is too little, too late. I think as part of that, Beth, I think you got to see the benefit of the week off, and I think you also maybe got to see the benefit of within that a couple of days off. Like literally, we can say the week off, and then in our heads, I think we think, well, that's he's got them in. He's looking after this. He's doing this. He's doing this. We know he's given them at least a couple of days off from everything that came out before the game. And I just wonder if time away from each other, time of just getting to recharge a little bit, refresh minds as much as anything else. Because the one thing I think they looked was they all looked bright. They all looked engaged with what they were doing. And I think you got the benefit of that in the game as well. Just that idea of, of they themselves haven't felt like they're going through the mill. Yeah, I think, you know, even as fans, it, it sort of was at a point probably after that West Ham game where you just sort of think, like, oh, I could just do with a bit of time. I could do with the end of the season now um, it, because it, it's exhausting and, and that sort of sense of doom and gloom that has sort of pervaded everything about Liverpool the last month or so. You sort of think, oh, I could do without that now. And so if you're feeling that as a fan, imagine how the players feel. They're having to come out and, and get on the pitch and come out and speak to the media. And, and like you say, they probably all just needed a little bit of you know, a couple of days off, a couple of days out of the spotlight, a couple of days without having to go again. And and I think that, that showed, I think it was a, a different kind of feeling about about Liverpool on, on Sunday. I think there was, was a freshness to them physically, but mentally as well. And I think that has probably been Liverpool's biggest problem over the last 
you know, month or so, I think the mental side, as much as the physical side, has has played a part in, in in the poor form. So, yeah, I think there was a was a sort of rejuvenated look about them on Sunday, and hopefully that continues into the last couple of weeks of the season. I think with them, what you get to see in that first hour, Dan, is all of it. Where as John said before, that idea of running back, but also running forward off the ball. I thought the shape was really good. I thought the press was really good. You know, the the numbers sort of indicate that Liverpool well up. I mean, Liverpool. I've got more pressure regains every game than anyone else anyway, on average. But they're well above their own average in this one, uh, which suggests that they they were able to to trap Tottenham. But I don't even think it's necessarily through a series of clever traps. I just think they repeatedly say to Tottenham, well, how good's your technique? Because we're going to really let you know how good's mm. that pass going to be? Because uh, there was a bit of them, to John's point before, there was a bit of them just ending up kicking it out for throws at times. Like, this is, we, we can't get out, we can't move, especially in that first half period. They were so full of energy from the get go, and I I almost mean that as like mental energy. Yeah, no, I, rather than same, anything else. Same, yeah. I don't think it was. Oh, suddenly you know these same players who've been playing the last few weeks look fitter or something like that. It was more um, they looked more confident in when they were choosing to press. They were much more relentless about it. When the first one went, the second and third man were doing their job behind them, so it wasn't like. The, the first one's going and then the one pass kind of kills them and then they're turning around throwing hands in the air and going, well, why didn't you follow me when I did my bit? Yeah. Um, and I think a key to that, what, what I noticed throughout the game was they were just communicating with each other so much more and they really had stopped in in many of the previous fixtures just talking to one another. And, that, and that, that, that's the mental point, isn't it? Exactly. And and I think when you when you do get pissed off with people, if you work in an office and you just start get to get irritated by the people around you, you do kind of stop talking to them and just get on with your own job and think, well I'll do my own work and then I'll go home. <laughs> um and I don't think it's I don't think it's entirely dissimilar. You talked about the days off. I do I do think just maybe spending some time away from each other may well have helped in that regard. You then bounce back in on the Thursday and think, all right water under the bridge we're back to it now he's the man who's going to play in front of me on Sunday afternoon I'm going to talk to him more it's going to be fine we're going to get through it together we're going to work as a unit and I think you could look across the pitch and see obviously you talk about, when you talk about the shape you mean the 11 but I thought you could see little trios yep. that were doing the jobs together yep. and and that's been really key in the manager's time here I think if you go back to you know, the period between 2017 and 2020 there were Areas of the pitch with three players knew each other like the back of their hands. And they always didn't have to talk sometimes because they knew exactly. Robertson knew where Wijnaldum was going to be and he knew where Mane was going to be in front of him. And he knows that Mane is going to attempt to press as soon as it's on the lad's first touch on the right-hand side. That that really went away, I think, in the past few weeks. They looked sort of consistently unsure of one another. And it just felt like you could see, for example, Alexander-Arnold, Elliot and Salah yesterday knew exactly when to go, knew exactly what kind of run each other was going to make. Someone's always going to be available and they just kind of box themselves off as a unit. And then in the centre of the pitch, McAllister and Endo doing a similar thing and you, you could go through everyone then at that point. It looked like they were all doing the overall bigger picture job, but also in these smaller groups were really looking after one another. And I think loads of that comes back to just, just talking. And I'm not quite sure... You know why they they got to a position where they weren't doing that that much. Even even the captain after the Everton game was saying things along those lines that they they just hadn't been backing each other up enough. Um, just just getting in each other's ears from the get go, and then that intimidated the opposition. Especially when I thought I thought they looked really miserable um, from very early on, and given you know how kind of carefree they were at the start of the season and the the sort of gregarious character of the manager, I think I think that's quite strange from their point of view. But if you're able to do the opposite, if you're able to say, well, these aren't going to talk to each other and aren't going to back each other up, so we're going to ratchet it up again, even compared to what we were planning to do from the start, you then just, you win a character battle, you win an attitude battle at that point that means that's what leads you to being 4 nil up. All the tactical stuff was great, loads of good individual performance, but if you win that battle of, of attitude, approach and personality from the start, then, then you're going to win the game. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. And I think, you know, we've all known from sports your football or whatever we played ourselves you can play against the team and you know and they seem together and they're all talking and, and everyone seems to know what to do but they're supporting each other and you think we're in, you know, we're in for, the, for the tough one here and then you can play a team who are maybe you know talented or got some good players and stuff like that but you think oh, if, it, if it starts going wrong they'll start arguing with each other or, or you know they're not cohesive and, and you know we've always sort of been, been part of those experiences that you know, playing sport at any level, really. And when Liverpool are at the best, you know, they are exactly how sort of Dan describes. And I think, I'd add to that, it's, you know, 
getting your head down and, and doing your sort of own job, you know, sounds <laughs> like a positive thing. But I think this Liverpool side, you know, has never really worked well when it when it's been doing that. And I think the the player who who symbolised the, the opposite of that for me yesterday was Harvey Elliott because I think you know he's joining them as a he's joining the attackers uh, making it a four you know on and off the ball in need be and the, when the pressing worked really well there was there was always a second player who was joining it and and the third goal sort of comes from that you know Salah is is pressing him and he gets himself in a bit of trouble and he turns away and suddenly Elliott's there and he's picking his pockets and he's and he's in and he's away and. So it's working well from a defensive point of view. I think Trent's spoken in the last couple of weeks when he's done interviews about being that fourth man in midfield and, and, and stuff like that. And and I think you, you swarm teams on and off the ball that way when you and and but when you're not doing that, you when you when you say, you know, well, you just play right back or you just play defensive midfield and, and they're playing just in their little areas, that's where I think it it goes wrong for this Liverpool side, really, because that's when gaps form or that's where it just gets a little bit easy to pass through us, you know, from a from an opposition point of view, really, and also attacks just start to look a bit predictable, and it's like, you know, oh, we, oh, we know where he's going to be stood, and we, we know when the ball's going to come, and you know, the player, the player who's right forward looks up, and he's just got the centre forward in the middle, and no one else, and 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 the, 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 whoever's playing left, Lewis Diaz, or whoever's sort, sort of, you know, wide, wide, and, and and not really sort of contributing. Whereas, I love it when you see the players, you know, popping up in areas you wouldn't necessarily expect. You know, Andy Robertson in the forward position is always a good sign for me. The things are going well mm. uh, because they're, because they're backing each other and they're thinking, well, my teammates will will cover for me if 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 something sort of does go wrong, and they stop doing that. Really, but it was great to see it yesterday, and I thought we were very good. And, and the only real shame is, is the little, you know, the two at the end because I think it flattered them. To be honest, Spurs four two. I think it flattered them. And it is John Gibbons from the Anfield Rap, and I'm joined by actor, creator, and now uh, music uh, hall phenomenon Johnny Owen. Uh, Johnny, welcome back to the Anfield Rap. First of all, you've been on before to talk about a film you're making, Three Kings, about three legendary managers, um, and now you're here to talk about something that is, I would say, taking the nation by storm. I would go so far to say, Johnny, uh, you and uh, a few friends have got together and put afternoon discos on, and they are, it's selling out up and down the country. Yeah, it's been brilliant, mate. My mates in Wales call me the Peter Stringfellow of, uh, of the month. <laughs> <laughs> Might have his, his length of hair these days. But no, I, uh, yeah, you know what it is, John? We tried this thing, a few mates of mine, Johnny McClure from Reverend and the Makers, his brother Chris and a, and a pal of ours called Jimmy O'Hara. We put one on before Christmas in Sheffield. We thought it might be because it was Christmas. You know, it sold out pretty quickly. So we tried in January, a, a notoriously difficult month to sell anything, and they all sold out as well. And we've got two coming up in Liverpool. Both, one is sold out and one is pretty close to selling out. So it's fantastic. We can't wait to get there, actually. Yeah, a lot of things going on up and down the um, country. You've got it in, in May and June, and I will read out the dates because I know people listen to us sort of you know, in lots of different places, but it, it feels like it's really sort of tapped into something and we are of a, of a certain generation now, aren't we, mate? I think it's fair to say when you still like to have a dance, but you like to be in bed at a, at a, at a certain time. And I'm finding somewhere like that is difficult. We, we had it a few weeks ago where it was getting to, you know, we'd had a few beers, it was getting to about eight o'clock and you were like, oh man, a bit of a dance here. But it's the, the, the town wasn't really sort of catered for that, but you guys have done that and it's and people have really enjoyed it and it seems to have been really welcome. Yeah, it is. I mean, I think we all recognise that world, don't we? You know, if you, if you sort of grew up in the 70s, 80s and 90s, we all ended up what they used to call clubbing. That was the word. There's a bit of a, of a, I think, a bit of a myth that we were all in fields raving. It wasn't like that. There were people that did that. But the vast majority of us went to clubs in towns and cities, you know, the old classic, you know, plastic palm tree and things like that and the glitter ball and listen to the songs of the time. And I think, I think that's really resonated with people. We don't try and be too snobby you know there's no point trying to be cooler at my age certainly like you know those days are long gone so we play songs that people recognize play songs that people love we sort of describe it as the greatest hits of the 20th century really uh, and we just sort of cater for people if they want to pint then there's a bar there you know if they want to dance if they want to sing along and uh, it's just worked really well Liverpool itself with um, a very famous venue called Camp and Furnace that people yeah. know really well in the city and I think as a city, you know, it's got one of the most famous musical histories in the world, really. The tickets went really quickly there and they've, and they've gone really quickly for the second one. And we haven't even been there yet. So I think, <laughs> I think as the saying goes, it's going to go off in the Liverpool one. I think people are going to really enjoy it, you know. 
Yeah, Camper Furnace is a great space and the, the acoustics in there are fantastic. And it just feels like when you when you watch the videos and I know you've done quite quite a lot of you know TV stuff, but also you put your own promotional videos out. And it's just for me, it's seeing those smiling faces. And you know, I, I know you've spoken to people who maybe, you know, haven't been clubbing for 10, 15 years, even longer, but are out there and trying to remember the moves and what they've got and things like that. And it, it, it's great, isn't it? It's, it just seems like smiling faces wherever you look. But we all need cheering up, really, with the world news and world events. I think everybody says it's, you know, it's not been the best time for us all, and especially coming out to COVID and lockdown and all those kind of things, you know. So it's just nice to get along. You can leave all your troubles at the door, really. Like, we don't really care about, you know, sort of... We, we sort of guide people and say it's better if you're over 30 because the music is very, you know, of a specific era, I suppose. But, you know, I think the idea is it's very safe space. You can have a dance, you can have a sing-song, you can enjoy it. And I think, you know... We, we were talking earlier on with me about getting home a bit earlier. We had this strap line you can get home for match of the day, like you'd have a curry and get home for match of the day or dance ice or whatever it is you watch. But I think that's what's really attracted to people because, you know, I used to love going out in the night when I was younger. I think we all did. You know, it's, it's, it's part of growing up and sort of that transition in this country that we all go clubbing. But as you get older, like you said, I prefer I prefer a daytime pint now. I prefer a few pints of my pals in the afternoon. And I just wanted to put somewhere on that, you know, would cater for that. I am. It's, Liverpool is one of those cities that I, I do come to or travel to a few times a year. I love it there. I love the people. And there is a sort of that street now where you've got a lot of bars in the afternoon. You get people with guitars playing. and Yeah, so, yeah. So I did see that. And that was of a certain age. It was all kind of like more my age group, I'd call it, really. And um, I seen that and thought there's definitely something where you could create like a nightclub, you know. So I love the fact lots of people said to me, you know, it was five o'clock in the afternoon and it felt like one o'clock in the morning you know it was dark <laughs> we're dancing the song and then when he when he spilled out into the into the sort of the daylight it's a bit like when he used to go to the pictures as a kid you know when it would be light and he'd be inside the dark so it's that kind of feeling as well but like you said it's the atmosphere and the people they make it and they've been terrific you, you mentioned there how we change and, and people's relationships with alcohol changes as well and i don't drink as, as much as, as i used to you know largely because the hangovers got worse and also with the young children it got sort of stared at. and i guess it's sort of catered for that as well and as i said i'm sure there's 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 a few you know people who go who, who have quite a lot to drink there'll be some people who, who have a little bit and then i guess there's people who, who just sort of don't touch it at all and something like this caters for that maybe a little bit easier than a nighttime event would as well yeah, absolutely. I mean, we get people of all sort of right across the range, really. There's loads of people that go there just for a dance and a sing song and the vibe. There are others that like it, like a drink there. I mean, I think there's something about our generation as well. All the venues have said, like, there's always record takings behind the bar. So it's <laughs> of a, of a drink. And we haven't seen, literally, we've not seen a crossword for everybody. I think everybody's just a bit older, you know. And so like, the atmosphere is really good in that sense. You know, nobody's there trying to, you know, there's nobody sort of, we're not full of testosterone anymore, a lot of the lads. So people just go there for a good time. They know what the vibe is. It's run really professionally. The songs are really thought about and picked. Specifically, we even do little regional varieties, like up in Glasgow, we played specific stuff there. We're going to do the same in Liverpool. We're going to be playing a lot of stuff that the people of the city are very proud of. I mean, the Beatles go down really, really well on the shows. We do twist and shout, you know, and we, we do the classic, we lower the volume for the R's, you know, and everybody joins in. I can't wait to see what that's going to be like in Liverpool. So there's, there's certain songs and certain things that go down really well. I think that people remember. We even have, John, like a slowish section at the end so people can have a bit of a smooch we call it in you know the slow section they call it i think in other areas but that bit where like my pal used to say if if george michael was on singing careless whispers and you hadn't pulled you may as well you may as well get off and get yourself a bag of chips because it weren't going to happen like you know <laughs> absolutely uh if people do want to go i'll just read out i won't do the, the sort of full tour dates while jelly has to sort of sit there uh but across may and, and june uh the the, the team are going to Leeds, Nottingham, Brighton, Edinburgh, London, Manchester, Sheffield, Cardiff, uh, Liverpool, there, and, and Glasgow. Um, so those uh, dates, if you want to sort of sign up for that, uh, the best way to do it is to sign up on the website and you get the information on maybe they're coming to your city soon. It's dayfever.os.fan. That's dayfever.os.fan. And it must be really nice, Johnny, just to do with your mates as well. You know, doing anything with your mates is more fun. That's sort of what the Anfield rap is, really. And, and having an idea, you know, maybe... A, we, saying to friends with a drink, should we have a go at this and then doing it and seeing it be successful? Just makes it more fun, doesn't it? It does. It's been brilliant. Like, we none of us expected it to take off like it has. You know, we've been covered by all the major news channels and sort of 
programs, been on everything really, because they've all seen something. And and you know, I do like the idea of it being sort of a, a destination for people. So like, if people wanted to go for, say for Liverpool for the weekend, and you can you know you can book some day fever, you know you book some for your mates, you get along, and you have a great time in that city. So that's that's why we're in places like Liverpool, Newcastle, Glasgow, that people can get along to London and try different ones. But the cities themselves, you know, the people there. They get along and they love it. And like I said, the videos show themselves. Like, you know, it, it's about 75, 80% female. And I think once the lads start working that out, it'll probably plan up a bit. <laughs> then but, you're um, definitely going to need some bigger venues. Yeah. <laughs> I think once the football season finishes, especially, I think there'll be like, there's somewhere to go on a Saturday afternoon. But, you know, it's like I said, I think it's the atmosphere, John. People know what it is. They recognise the world. And there's a second chance to have a great time, you know, but at a time of day that suits people much, much better. A mate of mine said something really interesting once. He said, he said, everything gets worse in the night, doesn't it? Like food, transport. He said, but as if you finish seven, eight o'clock, you can go for a nice curry, you can get home decently on a bus or in an Uber. And it kind of works out. And I think a lot of people are kind of attracted to that. I, I'm not one, you know, to run down a young generation. I think the young generation are great. You know, they do their thing like we used to. They've still got the night. It's just, I wanted to create something for more our generation to sort of enjoy themselves still on a weekend, you know? Well, absolutely. Yeah. If you want to follow them on Twitter and see what they're up to, it's at Day Fever UK. Uh, like I read out their website before. And yeah, uh, get yourself down to one of them dates. It looks like you'll have an absolutely fantastic time. But before we go, Johnny, it is a football show. So just to ask you, uh, first of all, how did the, the, the Free Kings do? Because you, you came in to talk about it. I know you spoke to Andy when we were promoting it. Uh, I, I loved it. Uh, you know, I love those stories. Obviously, you know, as Liverpool fans, it, it, it particularly resonated. But were you pleased with the reception and, and how that did? Oh, it did fantastically well. You know, it's, it was one of the most viewed things on Amazon. Three, you know, massive clubs with huge fan bases, John. So, you know, we, we knew we'd have, we were on a, having a good start with that, really. But what was lovely was, obviously, COVID came. But the week that it came out, it was, it was only in cinemas for three days because COVID hit. But in the, after the third day, it was number one in the UK box office. <laughs> so if only it had stayed, if COVID hadn't hit, I think it had done really, really well. But it did great on the streamer. People dip in. And what's lovely about doing it, as you know, we had a great conversation when I came on last, but those people like, obviously, Shankly with Liverpool, they're so important to the club. And the fact that a new generation can see them, learn about them and understand how important they were for, for a club like Liverpool is really pleasing for me. And, you know, his, his granddaughter summed it up brilliantly for me. She went, they just seem to get bigger every year. Same with Jocks. Same with Matt Busby. Every year, the legends seem to people seem to understand them sort of more and more and more. And you see the legacy now. Obviously, Klopp is leaving, isn't he, with Liverpool? And you've had a fantastic few years under him. And he's kind of got that connection with the club that kind of started with Shankly, really, where Shankly went to Liverpool and he said, I felt at home here. The people felt like the people of Glasgow. I knew the, I knew the passion was there for the football. And boy, did he take them on some journey. So it's great the stories out there and people are learning about him all the time. And I'm sure a real passion project for you because you just always seem to just love football, Johnny. And, and that sounds basic, but a lot of us, you know, I, I'll say I love Liverpool, first of all, and then and then football, I can sometimes take or leave a little bit. But, but for you, I know you're, you're a Merthyr of boy, and so they're your sort of traditional team. But I believe when you moved to Nottingham, you got involved in Nottingham Forest, sort of helping that out and stuff like that. Obviously, you've done this, which is why. I mean, it just comes across that you just fundamentally love footy and you love the stories that comes out of football and how it makes people feel. Absolutely. I mean, I think, John, my father worked underground, you know, I've just done a, a multi-part series for BBC Sounds on the miners' strike from, from the Welsh perspective, which is doing really well at the moment. But my dad passed away in uh, 2017 and he was he worked underground. Nothing unusual of that in South Wales. Pretty much everybody's fathers and grandfathers especially did. It was a bit like the docks say, in Liverpool. It was just what everybody did sort of 100 years ago, especially. Uh, but he would always point out other miners or people who worked underground. So from a young age, he'd always go, see him there, Bill Shankly, he'd worked underground. So it really stuck in my head. And when he passed away, I did think, you know what? That generation of men and women, you know, who worked in major industry, they're leaving us now. They, they, they're passing on, you know, so the, it's important to tell their stories. And he loved football. He loved football in, in a way that like Shankly did. So he loved yeah. stories of Shankly and he'd watch any football. And he came from a different generation. You know, we, we talked about it, didn't we, about the 50s in Liverpool in the 60s and how the 60s began the rivalry with, say, Manchester United in particular. But my dad would, would watch whoever was home. He'd go and watch Cardiff, Swansea, Newport, right through the 40s and 50s. And, of course, when it got to the 70s and 80s and I started growing up and I'd be like going, oh, I, I, you know, we don't like them or we like them, he'd go, why? It's just football, you know, it's just <laughs> team. So he came from, a, he definitely came from a different attitude and generation. And I think Shankly had that. There's a brilliant bit in the in the dock where somebody was telling me something and it made me roll laughing where Shankly would go and watch Celtic and Rangers. He just loved football. 
so he didn't care. Like he was like, there was no no idea with him that it was like that kind of sort of tribal thing in his head. It was just football. So when he went to Liverpool, especially that sort of like absolute passion for the game translated itself brilliantly into the into the fans and the cop and all those kind of things and such a big part of it and it just reminded me of my dad and, and their generation and that they just loved the game the game was everything to them and I think you know we can have long conversations about the game has changed now and it's and I'm I, even I get disappointed with how the modern game is and all this stuff in the bar and the prices I'm I'm with them because you can forget that for ordinary working class men and women it all was just about the love of the game. They just loved going to watch football on a Saturday afternoon. I'll tell you a quick, brilliant story about him. Just before he died, my younger brother took him uh, to see the Norwegian fjords because he always wanted to see them. He had, he had terminal cancer then, so he's like, I want to go and see the fjords. Anything you want to do, Dad? Yeah, I want to go see the fjords. So he took him to see the fjords, right? And my brother said they happened to have in his cabin Bundesliga football. And my brother said, I couldn't get him out of the cabin. He said, <laughs> And I go, Dad, here's the fjord you wanted to see. He goes, use a game on here, Cologne playing golf. Unbelievable. He just loved football. He just he would watch any kind of football. And that was him. And I think I've inherited a, a bit of that, definitely. And especially as I get older, I feel a bit more like him. That I just, I love the game. I love the people that involved the game. I love the supporters. I love the history. That's why I love telling these films. And um, I, I'm, I'm sort of like my mate telling me the other day, you're the only person I know that could make a film about Liverpool and Manchester United and get on well with both sets of fans. <laughs> But they knew that I was about I was about the game really more than anything and about telling the story of these wonderful men who don't forget, and this is the whole point of the film, were best friends, you know. Shankly and and and, and Busby people forget this. And we talked about it. Busby recommended him for the job. I yes. mean that's how close they were. What a remarkable thing for a man to do. And that wonderful story of putting the, the phone down and turning to Jimmy Murphy and going, I've just remind, I've just recommended Bill for the Liverpool job. He's gonna be honest now. You know, it's going to be, there's our next rivals. I mean, what a thing to do. So many other human beings, John, would go, well, actually, I'll try and keep him away from there. Not Busby. He went, I know the perfect guy for you boys. And he's over in Huddersfield. Go and get him. I mean, what a remarkable thing to do. And what a lovely story. Yeah, if anyone's not seen The Free Kings, I really, really would uh, strongly recommend it. It's a fantastic film and Johnny's passion, you know, for football of, of all times. It's obviously come from his dad and been installed in him, comes across. Um, so, yeah, watch that. Get yourself down for an afternoon disco in May or June as well. But, Johnny, really nice to speak to you. Nice to catch up. Thanks very much for coming on. Appreciate your time. John, always a pleasure. Always wonderful to come on the Anfield Rap and my best wishes to you and everybody else. On Elliot Beth, I'm delighted for him, not just the goal, but the selection. I think first and foremost, the manager decided to pick the footballers he wanted to watch play football, uh, which he now gets to do <laughs> as much as he wants in there. I think the selection's in there as, as, as a real testament to what he's been about, I think, all season. And there's a little problem that Elliot has, which is I think if Liverpool are on top in games, I think Elliot, and this is why I think the sub thing works, I think the sub thing's overstated. I think he is a good sub, but he, he tends to come on at moments when Liverpool need to be in the ascendancy, and that's where they are. I think he has a really good game up until the 60, 65th, 70th minute mark because Liverpool are having a really good game and he adds so much to that when that's the situation. He plays ever so well. The goal is obviously sumptuous, but I thought he was up before the goal. I felt he was Liverpool's best performer regardless. Yeah, and I think I think you're right what you say about the sub thing. I think in, in a way it's been used as a to praise him, the fact that he's been so good coming off the bench ball, so a little bit like a stick to beat him with because it's almost like when he starts games, it's easy to be like, oh, no, he is better off the bench. And and I do think he has been better off the bench this season, whether that just be because of circumstance. But for him to get a start against a good team, I mean, obviously they looked a little bit jaded yesterday, but and, and as you say, to be player of the match is... I think he suits play good teams. Yeah. I think you look at his record last couple of seasons. I think almost like I feel it's not that far away from the best of the opposition. The more you get out of Elliot, yeah. And I think if you, if you go back to that season, um, was it the season before last when he picks up that really bad injury at Leeds? I think the first few games before that he was starting every game. He was a starter in that team. He was obviously even younger than he is now, and he was being trusted then to be a starter in a in a, in a Liverpool team. So he's you know his talent is is not in doubt. I think it's just that consistency and that ability to consistently put in those strong performances when he's in the 11. And I thought yesterday was was really encouraging signs. And I think he has a, a fantastic relationship with Mo. I think that's really, you know, we've seen that off the pitch quite often. They, they do interviews together or if, if Harvey does an interview, he'll, he'll mention Mo and how he's been a mentor for him. And I think that sort of synergy on the pitch is, is visible as well and certainly was yesterday. And I just think he's better in midfield. I, I think when you when you try him out on the wing, he can do a job there. Of course, he can, and maybe you know in a cup competition or whatever. But 
I think when he's in that sort of slightly deeper role and he's given more of a license to roam and sort of, you know, go on the overlap or, or drop into, you know, get into the forward line, I think that's when he thrives and I think that's where he's got to play going forward on that right side of midfield. He's John, he looks to be adored by manager and teammates, I think that's there. I think it's because he's able to flit between the idea that he's carrying water to capable of doing something brilliant. I think that, I think he's got both in his locker. I think Liverpool's I think Liverpool have, have ended up in a funny water carrying situation across the last month. It's it's one of the question marks that sort of hangs over it as to whose job it's been and how effective that's been. I thought you got to see both sides of that from Elliot yesterday. There was periods where he was where he was just supporting everyone else around him and then periods where he comes to the fore. The goal is the obvious example. Yeah. Yeah, but like like you sort of both said, the the, the the goal is like a, it's, it's a cherry on top of a cake of a, of a brilliant performance, and and sometimes you know when you're looking for man of the match, or sometimes when 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 the TV or radio they're like, oh, give it to him because he scored a boss goal. Do you know what I mean? And, and I listen, you know, I can sort of get on board with that in a quite a childish way of enjoying football, but uh, he scored a belt to give it to him. But but I think like it's you know it's it is like you know we were so much sort of before that really, and his and his teammates and his manager do love him, and I think there's. There's different sort of reasons for that. There's often a coach's player and then a, then a player's player, isn't there? And, and, he, and he's managing to, to do both sometimes. And I think the coach obviously loves his efforts and he loves his bravery um, on and off the ball. He loves that that he that he shows and and he'll put everything in front of him. And I feel I feel like you know in a time of a little bit of uncertainty with a few of them, I feel the manager feels like he knows what he's going to get from Elliot. And I think his teammates enjoy him because his technique's good and I think if you feel like you're going to pass to him he's going to trap it and then he's going to sort of look around I think he's good at finding space and one of the reasons I agree with, with Beth's points on him playing better against better teams but I think one of the reasons for that is just there's more space on the pitch I think he likes it stretched I think it suits him in a funny sort of way I don't think he is massively suited at the moment to the games where you think he might be, whereas we're, we're at home against a team who were, who were putting 10 behind the ball and you think, oh, throwing an extra attacking player in the field feels like the answer, doesn't it? But he's not quite got that, you know, McAllister's pass where he, he just sort of, you know, finds, finds a killer ball. Uh, he's... I mean, he, he, I'm sure, I'm sure that will come. He's 21, but you know, he isn't, he isn't quite that kind of attacking player yet. He isn't like a, you, you know, a David Silver or, or some, something like that. But, but what he is is if, if, the, if the game is, is stretched and, and, and there's space there and there's this team having a go, you know, he can, he can do his defensive work and, and he can put himself about. But also, he can, he can find these pockets of space where he's almost, you know, one minute he is an eight, the next minute he's, he's wide right and then the next minute he's he's in the 10 you know and he can turn and go and I think his his teammates feel like to me like they can look up and and he'll be there he'll be there looking for the ball and he'll be, he, he won't be just sort of standing around he'll be, he'll be looking for it and if they give it to him he'll, he'll control it and he'll look to make something happen and I think players like that as well especially the attacking players we've got I think one of the reasons Mo likes him he thinks if I make a run he'll, he'll, he'll look for me and he'll try and find me and I think Players don't like it when they keep doing that, and it sort of doesn't happen because the the, the, the you know the, the player's not seeing him, or he's held onto the ball too long, or he's looked for like a safe option. I don't think Elliot ever does that really, and and that's to his credit. And yeah, he's 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 a great footballer. He's he's obviously a boss lad. You know, you can see that. You know, in terms of his popularity and, and how he carries himself, and there's and there's just loads more to come from him, which is brilliant. I'm routinely very impressed with his positioning. Um, which is something players don't don't often get that much credit for. Um, people would often describe only really centre halves as as good readers of the game. I think he's an excellent reader of the game. I think he's great at um, reading where the ball is going to drop if if a cross or a, a low ball is being put into the air and he's standing on the edge. I think he's really good in terms of his, his sort of short scale movement. Um, he'll he'll cover the ground around the edge of the area really well, and that does lend itself to to playing against the sides who are more likely to to afford you some space. The fact that that space is there doesn't just mean that you're always in it, though. You have to be intelligent enough to, to find it and then be talented enough on the ball to exploit it. And I think he's got he's got both of those things. He's, he's just a very, very smart player. Um, another one in this sort of crop that Liverpool have got in their, their, their early 20s, Beth, which I'll come on to in a minute, uh, Kwanzaa, I thought, was, was very good. Until he wasn't, and I don't mean that to sort of. Suddenly, there's more to do because Spurs are on the front foot and Liverpool shapes gone to bits. I also thought it looked like a hard game 
by 80, you know, I think that's perfectly reasonable. He's not got that much football at this level even yet. But if you focus on what's good up until about the 70th minute mark, you know, I thought there was I thought it was an excellent performance, really, really calm, about as quiet up until the 70th minute mark I've ever seen Son at Anfield. Yeah, I think it's been a, a tremendous season for him. And I think both him and Harvey are almost a, a victim of being a young sort of homegrown. I know Harvey obviously comes in from Fulham, but homegrown-ish English player in the sense that if you'd have brought in a you know a 22, 23 year old up and coming centre back from Spain or from Brazil and they'd have played the way Jarrell Quanta has this season he'd have been lauded for how he's come in and how he's adapted to playing in, in this Liverpool team Harvey Elliott the same I think if he was a young you know European player a young a Tyro yeah a young Brazilian player who'd come in for big money, you'd be looking and thinking, oh, he's a, you know, he's a little diamond and he's he's only going to get better. And I think because of the nature of football now and how much it is about money and how much people love to to blast the owners and you know with good reason at times. But I think both of those players become easy scapegoats when things aren't going well because it's easy to turn and say, oh well. That they didn't invest in a £70 million centre half from Spain or, you know, the flavour of the month from, you know, from a different league. Mickey van der Ven? Yeah, but like precisely. Mickey Longlegs? Did all right. Let's not be cruel. Um, but I think I think that's the thing. I think it's easy to to sort of beat them with that stick when they, they you know, things aren't going well for the team as a whole. But I think overall for, for Jarrell Quanta, it's been an exceptional season. I mean, when you think he was on loan in League One last season, to be where he is now is incredible. And, you know, has probably saved Liverpool an awful lot of money. Very calm. I think that's my main takeaway whenever I see Quanta, especially, again, when it's going well, and it's, this isn't a criticism, some players, you need players who are going to pull through for you when it is going brilliantly. So not going so well and turning it round a little bit. For me, though, Quanta suits the part of Liverpool. He's Liverpool's centre-back next to someone like Van Dijk when Liverpool are on top in games. Very, very calm, very assured. Not going to not gonna make it easy for an opponent, but also not going to get drawn into some nonsense either. Just going to play the game that's in front of him. I think he's marvellous. Um, and at the beginning of the season, if you looked at a, a 20, is he now 22? I think he was 21 when the season started, centre-half. Yeah. You'd have thought, oh, he's 21, he's still on the youth side, so he's, he's not going to amount to very much you know normally yeah. they get in at 17 18 and then they get a few minutes and still they gradually get better actually, and still like that. 21, 20, it was 20 he turned 21 in january ah okay so he's 20 at the start of the season um and again i think he's he's really suited to playing against the the good sides mm. um he's he's so talented on the ball um you know obviously since since conate has been here he's by and large played extremely well um he's an excellent defender but it's it's night and day between the, the two of them on the ball. You know, we, we've played against many sides in the past month or so who've been really happy to just say, connotate has got the ball as he sound. We'll mark everyone else. We're not even going to really press him because we're not worried about what he's going to do with it. You can't do that with Kwanzaa because he can he can play it short really quickly into feet and, and someone can go on the turn. He can knock it 50, 60 yards on a switch to Robertson on the other side of the pitch. He's got he's got everything in his locker, really. And I think, as you say, his, his, his approach to games and... The the really I don't know laid back <laughs> is the word, but but that that calmness is is such a skill, especially you know he, he played against Harlan the other week in a really high pressure game, and he was excellent. Um, didn't give him anything. Again, positioning, marking all the sort of defensive skills that you would talk about. I think he's really good at. But then having the ability to play as well is so important. I remember in the nineteen twenty season. Um, writing a thing, looking at the data of of, of Liverpool's attacks because they were, they were scoring so many goals and winning every single week. Um, and the key to the way they were playing at the time was Joe Gomez. Um, yeah. He was so good at playing pra- passes that broke the first line and then Liverpool are away. And, you know, when Alden's on the ball and he's looking for one of the forwards or one of the fullbacks, then it gets played across into the box and someone finishes it. But so many of the goals... Um, and there's a way, there's a way of tracking it through like the XG chain and all that kind of thing. Um, but, the, but the key to it was the fact that Joe Gomez was able to pass the ball extremely well. And I think if Liverpool are going to seriously challenge for for trophies in the next few years, they're going to have to be able to do that. And and therefore, I think I think Kwanzaa is a really key player if he's able to do the the fundamental defensive stuff and combine that with being 
an, an attacking outlet by which I don't mean coming up for corners and scoring seven a season. I mean by being able to set people away, put them on the turn, and Liverpool are on the break. Then that's huge tactically. Um, and from from the little I've seen of of people talking about the new manager and the way that he plays it and stuff, I think he's going to really like him. I think he's got. A, a very important role to play for Liverpool over the next few years. We've been excited, John, through the season talking about a lot of the younger players, but at times we've sort of, not least because of the way in which it's gone, we've sort of ended up that's people like James McConnell, who was 19. Um, you know, what the next manager who looks like it will be on a slot, he's got to work with, you know, Bradley, 20, Elliot, 21, Quanta, 21. We're not sure on Owen Beck yet, but he can't have done much more on his loan. Gravenberg in there as well. So Bosley and Jones are both 23. You know, before you get to the lads who are 24 and 25, that is a hell of a crop of, of 20 to 23-year-olds who you now also, that manager's able to look at and go, you know, with the exception of Owen Beck, they've all got Premier League experience under the belt. Like genuine, not like a game here and a game there. They're not being dropped in. They're not League Cup players who've done a bit. They've got real, real experience of playing against everyone from Manchester City all the way down to Sheffield United. Yeah, and they haven't show, just shown promise. They've shown, you know, top class performances. And, and that is really something, you know, you mentioned Conor Bradley there, some of, some of the performances he put in, particularly the Chelsea one, but not just that. It was, it was good as, as any right back in, in the country, you know, probably Europe in terms of that, that the level. I couldn't believe how good Bradley was against Chelsea. You're like, fucking hell, if Trent's played five games as good as this, he's done well. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was, and, and similar for Kwanzaa, how he's developed over the season. It's been quite phenomenal, really, and it's a massive testament to him, uh, obviously to the coaches and, and, the, and the manager for the belief that they give him and, and the work that they do. But, you know, he started the season pretty well, um, but but he's, he's kicked on, and every time he plays, he seems to have, have developed. And what I noticed yesterday, which I really liked, which is something that is is I think is new, is... He's tackling like a midfielder now as well. In that th there was moments where it looked like they were going to go, and then he was just—he was so front foot in the mm. tackle. I had to like check Ch it was him. Check it was him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're thinking he's that was like it was like a Fabino tackle. Do you know what I mean? He was like he was stepping in and and he was getting across and and you know the guy was <laughs> the guy you know the Spurs player was suddenly like where did he come from? Do you know what I mean? And it, he's taking a bit of a risk doing it, but he's backing himself and it's it's. You know, it's a risk reward thing, and it's a massive reward because he's he's getting us going when he's doing it as well. Because he's, he's stepping in, he's winning us the ball, and then, and then suddenly we're breaking away really. And so it's like a, it's another level of defending. He's not just like a penalty box defender. He's not just you know winning his headers and and you know not letting a centre forward get the better of him, which is all there. It's it's he's being proactive in terms of sniffing out danger, in terms of winning the ball for Liverpool, in terms of I'm gonna go go out there and, and get that. And listen, sometimes you give a free kick away and, and sometimes the, the guy will do something great and, and you might sort of end up looking silly. But but more often than not, the way he's doing it, it'll be of a benefit to Liverpool and and he's adding, as I say, he's adding something all the time, Quanta, and I'm, and I'm so impressed by him, and, and his mentality seems spot on, and he's backing himself, and he, he is doing really well. And, and listen, I think we, we need another centre-half in the summer because, Matip, you, you're expecting to go, and, and so numbers-wise, you know, unless he, he comes in and just decides Joe Gomez is a, is, is completely a centre-half, and, and, and then he, he wants to do some things at full-back, you know, that, that could happen. But I think in terms of... I won't be surprised if we if we buy a centre half in, in the summer, but you know he's gonna have to dislodge Quanser because 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 Quanser's you know playing like a starter and he's got things to learn. Don't get me wrong, I think he it, I think he's good on the ball, but I think he needs to see the pitch bigger and needs to see the pitch wider. I think he's a little bit the way he faces, he'll go. Um, but I think. I think you know that'll come because everything else is coming, and so I don't, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt that that you know in a few years' time we're we're saying you know we've we've got one of the best here, and you know I'll disagree with Beth. I think Warrington's just as glamorous as Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dan, both fullbacks uh, bang at it that first hour, especially Robertson. He's worthy of the goal. I thought he was absolutely magnificent. Um, what I think's really interesting is. A lot of what's good about Tottenham when I've seen them this season, less so recently, because not much has been good recently, but a lot of it's come through Porro. And I think it's interesting after Robertson goes off, you know, I think Gomez defends his back post admirably well. But what he doesn't do in the same way that Robertson does is just push push Porro back. Yeah. Porro's just got to defend for his life. Uh, Robertson's running off the back of Kulisevsky, who seems seemed at times surprised there was a football match. Uh, and, you know, I thought the speed of brain and movement of Robertson, I thought he was genuinely tremendous yesterday. 
Yeah, I've actually enjoyed watching Robertson to to an extent over the, the past month when things have been poor. Um, I love when he came on against Sheffield United. He completely changed the game. Yep. And, you know, Alexander Arnold's maybe a, a sort of exception that proves the rule in this way, but you don't say that about fullbacks very often that they've come on and changed something, um, especially against the side that, that was sitting in and wasn't really getting off that much except for on the break. Um, Porro's a really good player but I, I don't actually think he's a full back he's a wing back um, he's really good going forward I'm, I'm not so sure about the defensive stuff but then test him on the defensive stuff and it seemed like they'd, they'd very much done the homework on that and Robertson knew full well I'm playing really high up the pitch here I've got very little interest in doing the, the five ten yard passes with Virgil um, I am standing as high up the pitch as I can and he, he was obviously in the box for the goal but he was in there in the first half so often yeah. yeah, just looking for balls over the top he was trying to knock them back even the, the goal comes from he's not necessarily looking to score himself he just he, he plays it back in and then is really reactive afterwards I think I think his attitude across the course of the past month has been great he's looked like he he was one of few that kind of knew he was fighting for something really and was trying to get the best <laughs> out of the rest of them and you know it, it, it didn't happen over the course of that time but now that, that everyone else seemed to kind of be on his a, a similar mental level to him, it, it all worked out. Um, and Gomez played extremely well, I think, throughout the, the course of the time that he was starting, when he was he was switching between right and left, depending on whether Bradley was playing or Simakas and stuff like that. I think Gomez has a great season. But the, the balance is always so much better when it's when it's a proper maraud and left footer down there. You can't you can't understate the the importance of Robertson to this Liverpool side over the course of the years that he's been here, and yesterday I think was one of the best one of the best in years that he's played. I thought he was absolutely excellent. Uh, I liked he marauded. There was a lot of marauding going on. There was also a lot of to to, to Dan's passing point there. He passes to his centre half Van Dijk four times, out of twenty two first half passes, seven to Gakpo, five to Elliot. That tells you where he was playing his football. He was playing his football right the way up there. That's who he was getting involved with. Even the very fact that he finds Elliot five times, I mean, he's theoretically the right side of eight. He's the left back, and yet this is happening. You know, for me, Beth, he, he decided, as to Dan's point, I do agree with him across the last month. I think he was the one who seemed the most decisive full stop when it wasn't going so well, but he decided yesterday it was going to be his game, and good God, until he got substituted, it was his game. Yeah, and I think that's maybe been a part of Liverpool's problem over the last the last month or two. I don't know what the stats are over the course of that period, but it feels like there have been too many of those five yard passes between the full back and the centre half and you know, but into the midfield and then back to the centre half. And I think having a player who has not just the the will but the ability to to push on and, and be proactive and higher up the pitch is is exceptional. And I think Andy Robertson, you know, there've been times over the course of this season hasn't been his best season. Obviously, comes with the caveat he was out for a very long time with a very serious injury. But I think people have almost tried to make out that he's passed it a little bit, and you know, is is influence in this Liverpool side has waned considerably and I think the last few months have shown that that's not the case because when he's on it he's a tremendous tremendous player and it's not just you know he's not just a player who will, who will run himself into the ground he does that but he also has enormous quality and I think when Liverpool have been at their best under Jurgen Klopp it's been so much down to him and Trent and, and what they've done on, on the respective sides and I think you know I think he, he was he was excellent yesterday and I think Trent was probably his best game in a long while and I think a lot of that comes from the fact that he's playing out wide and I think that is such a difficult one and in, in a way it's such a tired debate, is he a fullback, is he a midfielder but I think the new manager, that's got to be something that has to be addressed because I think I think he can absolutely play in midfield, Trent, I think he has that ability but I also think he does his best work when he's he's out on the flanks and I think that's something that that on a slot, if it is him, looks like it will be, we'll have to address. I think both, both of them, uh, both fullback play ever so well. As I say, Robertson more explosive over the course of the game. I think with Trent, you get to see the, the benefits of him being able to choose. I also think it's easier for him with a player like Elliot, where Elliot is, and I think it was easier for everyone with Endo and McAllister being a bit more balanced. McAllister playing off the left, but dropping back in, Endo then shuffles over. There's more room for them, John. You know, I, I think Endo looked pretty pretty tired um, around the start of the, the start of April. Uh, he's one who looked looked to me like he really benefited from from a couple of a, a couple of days off and a little bit of a reset. But I thought all of that looked tidy, and it allowed the idea. Well, actually, Robertson showing in the attack, and we're almost attacking two, three, five. The the two of the centre halves, the three then are McAllister, Endo, and and Trent, and the five of the rest of them. 
Yeah, the, the the cavalry didn't come sort of quite in time for Elliot. It's friend though, did it? You know, he he, he puts an incredible shift in for, for for club and country. You know, sort of over the period, and then he's sort of waiting for for midfielders to come back, and it just takes maybe slightly too long for him. And so there's a couple of performances, you know, at Atlanta at home being one where it, where he just sort, sort of looks short, and he's because he's not. Because he's not a, a phenomenal footballer, if you like, he needs to be sort of, you know, he, he makes up for that in, in other ways. And, and listen, he's a really good footballer. You won't get to it where he has it, sort of without it. But he's not. He's it's not the s- mental point as much as anything yeah, else again, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, but he's he's not someone. He's not someone who can, you know, <laughs> who can sort of, you know, drift in and out of games and rely on a moment of magic. Say, so you know, he's someone who needs to be sort of right on it, and then he's, you know, contributing massively to a, to a football team. And but, you know, I. We'll wait and see with with a lot of them. You know, it's a new manager, it's a new time. You know, there's a little bit of a talk of of, of the guys who were coming in on the on the on the you know the sporting directors and the transfer you know gurus who who maybe don't fancy a couple of the players who've who've been brought in in their absence. And you know, Endo could be one of them. Who knows? But but I think you look at him and you struggle to see how how any manager couldn't find a place for him. You know, in terms of not necessarily always in the starting lineup, but within a squad because of his attitude, because of what he's able to to show, because you know it's how dependable he is. Really, I hope there is a, a future beyond the club for him at this football club because I think he's deserved it. I think he's, you know, he's passed more or less every test this season, and he's done everything and more that we could have expected, you know, from him and. and yeah, so so listen. I'm, I'm sure the manager will, will come in and look at him and, and think, yeah, there's definitely plenty for him to be to, to work with. Even if he go, he, what he says, I want to go out and there and get another player who's, who's maybe played in a similar position. I think he's, I think he's done ever so well this season. He should be proud of his of his Liverpool career so far, and, and I'm pretty sure it'll continue. Um, Gakpo Dan, such a good header, uh, full stop. Um, but I just thought he was excellent again. It's another one where you, I mean, first and foremost, the four great goals. <laughs> Even though I know Robertson's is a tapping, but yeah. the whole move that builds up to it, it's a, you know, he's part of that. That move, I was really like you know I was like, every single time with the ball in the back, I was like that's a great goal, that's a great <laughs> goal, and and Gakpo's was a great goal, but again it was it was it was a cherry on top of a performance, and obviously someone has still got to stick it in the back of their net, so you get to say that because they win well, but I thought that he was I I, I thought he was very good, very bright. I think he enjoyed the fact that he got to flit uh, with Diaz. I think he yeah. he really enjoyed that. I thought I really enjoyed the movement more than anything. Um, he was just constantly shifting around the pitch. It looked like loads of times they didn't know who was supposed to be picking him up and that meant that he was just finding space happen for the goal, for example. No one's really that close to him by the time he actually meets the ball. I, I sort of don't remember either of their centre-halves playing, if you know what I mean, because they, <laughs> yeah. they both come with reputations. The lads, one's dead fast, one's dead nasty, uh, <laughs> if you know what I mean, to be really reductive. I don't remember either of them doing anything no. and yet they've conceded four goals, if you know what I mean. Like and I, That's I, telling. I do think an awful lot of that was, was he was able to find space really cleverly. Yeah. Um, over the, the the past few months, I I think a, a lot of sort of what he wasn't doing was was just the graft. Um, I remember the manager to to sort of Fabinho in his final seasons levels absolutely screaming at him for twenty seconds each when he came on against City and when he came on at Old Trafford in the cup game, and it was because he wasn't putting pressure on defenders when he should have been, and I think he was getting really frustrated with him around that time, and. I mean, in in hindsight, maybe people knew, but I didn't. But his his wife was heavily pregnant, and stuff like that. Again, you you have to treat them as human beings, um, and and maybe he was up nights and stuff, and stuff was just harder. But I think in the past month or so, like I thought he was great at Fulham as well. Oh, yeah. Probably the Pool's best player that day. He looks just um, just sort of mentally unleashed on a, on an individual level. He looks like he's he stopped worrying. He's working loads harder, and he's doing the stuff that he he previously did. Certainly, especially last season, where like technically he's a really good passer of the ball. He's great at carrying it. He's really good at like taking Liverpool up the pitch quickly. That's why when he when he first came, I thought he might end up playing as an eight because he's just great at driving. Um, he's been yeah. doing that really well from the left in the past couple of appearances, and and just getting back to to what he was good at. Um, you know, he, he might not sort of get the the numbers in the data of what like Nunes gets in terms of shots or big chances and stuff like that. Um, but he's he's clearly a very competent footballer and and a really smart one. And that's why I think when his his performances were, you know, he kind of receded into himself. It was frustrating because it was like, lad, you're clearly good and and you've shown <laughs> you've shown loads of times for Liverpool before. So could you just kind of get back to doing that? And he, and he has. And I think that's been been a mental thing more than anything. And yeah, as I say, the 
technique of the header was great. He was linking up well with different people. But what I, I really enjoyed was just how he never stopped. He was constantly helping his teammates, but more importantly, constantly, constantly making problems for them. And a lot of that's just sheer hard work and belief. I think like Dan says as well, I think he's so intelligent. I think that was the, the, the standout thing when he came to the club. I mean, he had that patch, didn't he, when he, he first signed in about a month or so and Liverpool were going through that torrid run of form and you sort of looked and were like, why have Liverpool signed this guy? Because he, he didn't quite know what he could bring and then very quickly you realise actually he's an incredibly talented footballer and I think for, for most of last season it almost felt like he was being moulded to be the, the Firmino replacement and I think he's got the intelligence to, to do that to be that sort of false nine and to link up the play and he's so tidy on the ball um, but I think this season he, he's been a little bit of a, a spare part at times in, in the sense he's had to step up and, and fill in for, for various different players I think his favourite position is on the left and I think when he's given you know the, the license to roam a little bit, that's when you see the very best of him. But I think he's a tremendous footballer, and I was I was sort of gutted when he was going through that poor patch because he was getting scapegoated a lot. And listen, his performances weren't great, and but it, it did sort of feel like he was bearing the brunt of a lot of the the frustration. And I think now to see him sort of back to not even his best, but back to a really high level. And you know, you mentioned earlier about all of the young players that the new manager is going to inherit. He's twenty four years old. He's a, you know he's still got a long Long way to go before he even reaches his peak. And his so, birthday tomorrow. Oh, oh that's nice. Oh, Isn't lovely. that nice? Twenty five tomorrow. What a lovely few weeks he's had. Indeed. Um, but yeah, he's only going to get better, and I really do hope that you know that the new manager sticks with him, and I think he will because I think he's I think he's too talented to to give up on. So he's almost a year younger than Fuad. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, Fuad was twenty six yesterday. It's a, yesterday was not he? So there you are. Uh, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, yeah. What's what's Fuad doing? What's he playing at? What, uh, what's he up to? <laughs> Who would you trust to do your big shot? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting with the manager and Fuad. I never asked for Kyle. Come on, <laughs> it's interesting with the manager with 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 Cody Gakpo because he, he seemed to sort of really trust him for a while, didn't he? And, and the big games he was starting him ahead of Nunes, and I think a few people, you know, sort of didn't like that. Um, and then, and then his trust seemed to sort of ebb away, and and then there was just a, a couple of comments a few months ago, which were quite interesting from Jurgen, who said like he sort of went, "Oh, he's not playing great at the moment, but I feel like it's my fault, and I've been like moving him around too much and stuff like that, and I've maybe like kettled his head a little bit." I'm really interested to see what the next manager makes of him because if it is Arnie Slotty, he'll obviously should know him pretty well, you know. Do, uh, from, from from Dutch football and stuff like that so you be aware of of what he can sort of do in that league um, I just wonder whether you know a new manager might be good for him in particular you know there's going to be it's going to be interesting for a number of players isn't it you know because especially if the formation changes you know there'll be players who, who look brighter next season under a, a different manager there'll, there'll be players who you know they won't necessarily sort of get on together that that always happens but for, for Gakpo it's an interesting one for me and I just wonder whether you know, if Jürgen was sat here now, you know, you say, well, who do you think you've managed well this season and who do you think you've you've maybe not? I think I think Akbo would maybe be one of them where he feels like, do you know what, I've, I've maybe not, you know, managed him on an individual level as well as it could have. And, and listen, this isn't me massively criticising the manager because it's hard. You've got, you've got you know, 20-odd lads all to manage and you're trying to win football games and you're sort of trying to win the next next one, you know, mostly. But, and... and you know, sometimes, you know, people can fall through the cracks or or, or, yeah. or, or or they can be sort of, you know, victims to circumstance and things like that. But I think Gakpo maybe is is one, and, and he sort of, like I said, half admitted it, maybe one where he feels like, you know, I've, I've maybe tried to do too much with him and it's ended up, he, he's, 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 he's sort of all been a bit of everything and a bit of nothing. And, you know, maybe he's a bit, if he's been a bit confused on the pitch sometimes, that's that's been sort of on me or... I think in a really basic way, he probably wishes he'd have got him in the team a bit sooner in terms of this one. Because I think there was a time where he was just going Diaz, Nunes, Salah all the time. It felt he was just going the three of them and the three of them and Jota was out and Gakpo was just sort of sat there. And and, and listen, part of that's all on the player because when he was coming on, he, he wasn't necessarily showing off. You know, that old traffic game being an example of that. But now he has got in the team and he is showing so much. I wouldn't be surprised if the manager's gone, you know, I, I maybe shouldn't have persevere with, with that front feed so much or try to you know force it and, and, and a bit more of Gakpo wouldn't have necessarily been a bad thing but hey I think in terms of you know the the new manager Dan just to sort of sum up a little bit what he's coming into I think he got to, I mean anyway that result puts Liverpool 18 points clear of Tottenham 
in fifth place. When you just a cursory glance at the table, Liverpool, Liverpool are ahead, at 11, ahead of Villa. We obviously go there next Monday night. That can change. They could win that game. But Liverpool do just look, you know, we, we can see the excellence of the two sides ahead of us, but Liverpool do look just far closer to their company than to, to what's beneath them. Villa have lost nine games this season. Liverpool In the league, Liverpool have only lost four. You know, Arsenal have lost five, City have lost three. You, you sort of go through all the obvious bits. Spurs have now lost 11. Newcastle have lost 13. Uh, you, you know, you're going down that sort of list and going, this is, this is where this Liverpool side currently is um, in terms of, that comparison against the teams around them. I thought yesterday was a really good example of it. Tottenham want to play a bit like us. The similarities mm. there. We're just well better. It's on the same level, no. No way near. No, I think it's it's just a really good time to take the job. Um, you know, maybe in, in the past few weeks, people's view of that may have changed and thought, oh, you know, eight players need bomb deer and they need to buy a load more and all that kind of thing. Um because before that, people might have said, oh, you know, maybe one or two and just just keep going. And um, isn't it a shame that the current manager isn't staying and we're not just persevering with this? I think the, the answer is is in between and, and always was. Is um, He'll do his own work and stuff, but there are, there are two brilliant sides in the division and Liverpool are very close to them. And, you know, realistically, you wouldn't take a job in a better position than that because it's probably not going to be available and you wouldn't want it worse than that because then you've got seven teams or something to try and overtake um, so I think if you're if you're the new fella it's it's nigh on ideal there's also there's a really big squad of players so you know John's mentioned quite a few that they will want to look at over the summer and the new people that are working in the background might be assessing and stuff like that but it's a really good group I think to be having a look at you know Very coachable going, group I think as yeah, well yeah, yeah. yeah I think and I think you've seen that throughout the course of the season we've mentioned it again throughout throughout the show about different players some of them young some of them older that are that are really adaptable players and characters there yeah and I think that's really key I I think I, I mean I'm sure he will he's it, he's he's been talking about it enough he's he's really <laughs> set his store he's a forthright <laughs> man isn't he <laughs> funny isn't it um, but I also know Jürgen saying I'm, I'm, well I'll give him a bell <laughs> yeah. you know that, that's this um, odd little thing I like Jürgen said everyone's got my number and I'm like well I haven't <laughs> 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 like does that mean is, is people just ringing him all the time driving him mad yeah he's got WhatsApp people yeah WhatsApp for people going to you Jürgen Klopp yeah can't get on can't get off the phone from people just constantly no. Trying to watch the snooker. I yeah. think it's going to get to a point in like his next press conference where he's sat and his phone goes and he's like, oh, it's on again. I'm going to have to answer him. Like, he's doing me, Eddie. But yeah. in terms of, terms of where, where they are in terms of performance and where they're going to finish the season, but yet the, the group in terms of personalities and players, I think he'd look at this and go and fucking bang up for that. Yeah, uh, feels like he can have a very, very, very good summer doing it. Feels like he's desperate to do it. Feels like he's talking about it enough, <laughs> as Dan says. Beth, Goes into work now and can't bear looking at them. Uh, well, I, I, well, I think there is a thing. I think we are reaching the point, Beth, where, you know, obviously... Four he calls them by forward, not Mo Salah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they win 5-0 at the weekend, fire all. It's, se- it's his second to last home game as well. It's mirrored. They've got another game, obviously, next weekend. Then they've got their last home game with them, and they love him. You know, whether we, you know, we, we, we're still finding out a lot about him, but they love him, absolutely adore him there. Um, I'm just trying to work out as and when, you know, will the final formal announcement be before their final home game? Will it be after? Does everyone just rock through because everyone knows what's happening? Like, do we need there to be statements on club websites? I'm intrigued, though, not least because I've got money on it. I'd like it to pay out. (laughs) (laughs) I think think the announcement probably should come before their final hope, just out of respect for, for final, because I think, you know, we have had time to sort of mentally prepare ourselves and listen of course that the fate and fans know what's going to happen and I suppose there's an argument like you'll get you'll get the send off anyway but I just think from sort of the club's perspective they will probably want to give him some sort of official send off and I think yeah, you can't do a guard of honour for him if yeah. you haven't publicly said he's going <laughs> yeah, even if he himself is on the phone to Jürgen <laughs> as he walks through it yeah and that, that's the thing I think as much as he is doing the absolute most to let everyone know that he's going to Liverpool I think the club obviously like you say they can't officially do anything and therefore I think it's it's only fair that the club probably make that announcement um, but I, I think completely I agree with, with what Dan said I think he, he's coming in at, at the best possible time and I actually think in, in a way you know obviously I'd have loved Liverpool to have won the league this season I'd have loved them to have uh, you know absolutely if, yeah um Controversial, I know. I'd have loved them to win the league. Um, but in a way, I think the fact that they haven't makes life a little bit easier for him because I think he's, all, he's already such a tough act to follow, Jürgen. But I think the last 
few weeks have made people think actually maybe it is time for a change maybe it's time for a change for him maybe it's time for a change for the club and therefore I think that makes his life a little bit easier and I think probably the biggest one of the biggest positives really to emerge from this season is is toward the end of last season when Liverpool were looking a little bit jaded and you're thinking they look like a an aging squad they look like a really aging squad and you're looking and you think there's not an awful lot of, of young talent that can be relied upon and I think that's completely switched this season and I think, you know, we've spoke about the young players coming through and then you've got players who are 24, 25, 26 approaching the peak and I think for, for a manager to come into that is really exciting. Yeah, it is, it is. And, you know, he, he'll be, you know, he will be, you know, he's sort of chomping at the bit and, and I, you know, and I agree with, with Beth, I think that he probably should sort of announce it before, you know, for, from a from their point of view, but, for us, I think, you know, I agree with what, what Dan said before as well, that, you know, you can, you can talk yourself into, you know, ripping it all up and starting again, or, or you can, you know, when it's going badly or when it's going well, you can just say, oh, you know, I'm not sure we need any players at all. But, you know, he'll have his own idea of, of how he wants to play. And, you know, we're putting this structure in place so they can make sure that, that he's got the squad that, that he wants in terms of, you know, not just talent, but also the, the range of abilities and, and the, not the range of abilities, sorry, the range of, ta- of, of skills that, that is needed to sort of play his football, really. But there's there's versatile players that we've got. You know, there's not many where you say, well, he can only play this position or he can only play this style. He can only do one thing. Yeah, or he can only do, you know, if we don't play him in this formation, he's, he's going to struggle. I don't think there's not many at all who, who, who I would sort of say. And I find myself, you know, because we know something else is coming, looking at them, even a little bit on Sunday when we're going well and going, oh, I think he'd do well in a two. If, if he does want to do sort of 40 free one or I wonder what's about that, look as a 10, you know, just an out and out 10, do things like that. And, you know, there's, there's so much, many possibilities for this manager. And, and yeah, we, we all want to see a couple more come in and I'm sure that the manager will too. It's really interesting to get a link with wide players, but I don't think that necessarily means that he doesn't like the ones we've got. He just might have a different idea for someone like a Mo Salah who might just say, oh, you know, you know what, I'm just going to stick him up front and watch him score a million goals and maybe that'll be all right too. There's, there's a lot to be excited about, you know, beyond, you know, the, the current manager who's given us so much excitement and more. There we are. Uh, it's been the Anfield wrap after Liverpool's 4-2 uh, against uh, Tottenham Hotspur. Thank you very much to Green King. Uh, Ash O'Rourke for looking after the images. Me for doing the sound. You were uh, great. Admirably, thank you very much. Uh, John Gibbons, uh, Dan Austin and Beth Lindup. Uh, yep, yeah, Liverpool absolutely moving forwards. They've got eight days between Tottenham and uh, Aston Villa. Uh, could well ruin uh, the last home game at Villa Park. Uh, I very much hope they do. 